last video, I made a bold statement that I think that there is a golden age of Cirque du Soleil that went from 1985 to 1998. And one of the really wonderful shows, which is still going, is O oh in Las Vegas. It's a show that's near and dear to my heart. Eventually, I wanna get around to a point of cutting across all of those shows. And a much easier thing for me to do is just to watch one show that I've seen many times and comment on it. I think it'll give a taste and a flavor for the way that I think about these shows. In the timeline of the golden age of Cirque du Soleil, we're very much near the end. He went came to us and said, can you make me a new show for my new casino? So we go meet him and he said, okay, you guys here, I have this space, it's about size of a football field, two it's football field, two football field, it's with water, there's a show in the afternoon, and then there's a show in the evening, and then can you make me something? And then we was, oh my god. Steve Wynn has offered Franco and his team the opportunity to make a show on top of, quote, a football field of water, which we now know as the Bellagio Fountain. By contrast, Mystere is a very intimate show. The furthest seat is about 42 feet away from the stage. So how are they going to be able to translate their work onto something of this massive scale? They went back to Steve Wynn and said, forget about the football field of water. What if you build us a theater with water instead? Cirque du Soleil had a short history of bespoke theaters built for their shows. In fact, you might look at the stage from Mystere and then look at the stage from O and think they're kind of similar. One just is filled with water while the other is dry. We see. Yeah, we, we should have do, to do a theater, theater yeah. with water. Yeah. And then he said, okay, well, what would you do in it? He said, well, we will have fountain. Yes, we will have stunt and we will have this and that. He said, yeah, but uh, what's the show? And then, yeah, yeah. and then there was a limit of what we could do, actually. Yeah. And when we say, okay, we want a real theater, and the water is the stage. We, we, we can, can go move. from black to white. Exactly. We can have water and no water. That was the idea. They haven't yet built a water show. This is the first time they have actors going in and out of water, costumes going in and out of chlorinated water, makeup going in and out of chlorinated water. Very real risk of people being harmed or losing their way in a, in a, in a dark pool. The level of engineering that had to go on to make the show possible is really significant. So they've agreed now that the show is going to be in a theater with water, but what is the show going to be about? In a little sentence that convinced Steve, water is the memory of the world, yes. and theater is the expression of this memory. Exactly. It's what. And then it became the theater of all. Yes. And yeah. then you had this vision. It was the Lilith, the, the woman before Eve. Yeah. L Lilith is in a garden, and she's looking at the sun through the leaves in the tree. Yes. Yeah, under the under the, the leaves yeah. of the tree, yeah. the light comes through the leaves, yeah. touch her and there is a pond there, yes, yeah, yeah. and that's the show. Lilith is a character from early Judeo-Christian folklore. As Franco says, she's the woman who came before Eve in the creation story of Adam and Eve. She left paradise because she refused to be subservient to Adam. She is even known for refusing to lie down beneath Adam sexually. Sounds like a strange detail, but I believe that you can still see echoes of that story in the show to this day. Is she an independent woman who is equal to Adam? Or is she an agitator? Is she a demon who heckles and tortures man? In either case, she was a source of inspiration for the show. Yeah, I said, mm, how to explain this to Steve Wynn? It's gonna be difficult to tell this to Steve Wynn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the end, they were able to convince Steve Wynn of the idea. Steve, in an interview, said that he gave Franco everything Franco asked for. He wanted six months of rehearsals in the space, which meant they had to build the theater before the hotel and allow the creative team to rehearse on site until the casino opened. He wanted a live audience to see what their genuine reactions to the show were. Steve Wynn organized buses for members of his staff and their families so that two or three times a week, 500 people could attend the rehearsal. And to this day, there's a sense that O oh, is sort of a show that has a hotel built around it. It's also important to remember that towards the premiere of this show, Franco Dragon is having medical issues with his heart, but they completed the show and it premiered on October 17th, 1998.
This is the hottest ticket in Las Vegas and one of the most expensive with seats starting at $90. You are inside the state-of-the-art 1,800-seat auditorium built specifically for Cirque du Soleil's O production. The cost? More than $95 million. No other show of this complexity exists anywhere. We have an, an elaborate series of stage lifts that are quite remarkable. At one moment, we can have a solid stage, and then another, we can have an entire stage go completely to 25 feet of water. On October 17, 2023, they were able to celebrate their 25th anniversary and dedicate a plaque to Franco Dragon in the entryway of the theater. Everything I'm going to talk about now is something that we see consistently building or applying to all of the different shows in the in the Golden Age. They are the underlying traits that Franco Dragon infused his shows with. The first element is maybe the most obvious one, the physical performance, the physicality of the shows. The physical performance is the beating heart of the show. It's the engine of the show. I think Franco Dragon understood that when people observe a physical performer doing something impossible. It creates a vulnerability. When you've shown somebody six or seven or eight impossible things in a row, it suspends their disbelief. Okay, we need, we need virtuosity, we need performance. We want that people go over themselves. And you can play with them a little bit. You can show them other strange things that are impossible or strange things that are funny or interesting. But this is the engine of these shows. It's the physical things that they're doing that are propelling the show forward. It's the reason why people show up to see these shows. And I think he always understood that, that that has to be the thread that runs throughout the show. And you know, all the artists there, circus act artists, they were not talking about their acrobatic things or things, they were talking about the character their character what the, role they play in yeah, the show exactly. not the salto they do yeah like, even though they love to do the salto sure. and to push the envelope yeah. but they always you push for behind the salto you must have an intention yeah what do you yeah what do you want to tell right? yeah. what do you want to tell with yeah. your salto yeah. i think franco dragon understood that if you try to do traditional narrative where you're just focused on telling a good story and developing characters you're going to be competing with the reason why people are actually there they're there to see people do contortion they're there to see people do flips you think that the numéros the spectacle will be composed of numbers that will have a début and a fin et ensuite un autre numéro, et ensuite numéro. Eh bien, là je vous annonce que on va essayer de faire tout le contraire de ça. Nous allons découdre les numéros, nous allons déstructurer les numéros afin de faire un spectacle à concept intégré. And while Franco is pursuing that integrated concept, he uses a simple plot to tie the show together. The theater manager picks an audience member, draws him into this world, and takes him on an adventure. There's an aphorism that there are only two plots. A man goes on a journey, or a stranger comes to town. O is very simply a man going on a journey, and we are going on that journey with him. The theme is quite different from the plot, however, and we'll discuss that in depth later. To produce a show that has no real linguistic story development allows you to be able to show that to anybody in the world without the, the baggage of culture, language, and um, trying to tell a complex storyline. What a dream mean, what love mean, what a death mean, what a, a war mean. We all dream, we all cry, we all love, and it's not only a cultural uh, a medium that we have to use. The next element is just really top-rate visual composition. I think Franco Dragon has an incredible eye for images and for visual balance. I have a theory that you could take a picture of every act, just somewhere in the middle of every act, and just the image is just beautiful. The combination of the lighting, the positioning of the artists, it feels organic, it feels alive. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's it's small and intimate, but it's just interesting to look at. It's just well composed. In fact, Franco has talked a lot in his career about how central images are to his process. We are not looking for the final picture. We play like little kids and each image we find, we are happy like little kids. And we this image, we can build another image. 
ce que je vois pendant que la musique joue. There is something wrong if all I see while the music plays is a trapeze act. On the other hand, when I have two ropes, an iron bar and someone on the trapeze with music and lighting, that all of a sudden gives me something else, not just a performance but an image. If I have images that think, then it works. The music has to help me construct and write down images that think. The next element is an insane number of references to other things. We want theater, we want evocation, so we share everything, you know. It could be in Japan, he sent me a picture from Japan. Everybody who is working on this show have to put ideas and yeah. brings sometime uh, an image or bring sometime uh, an article or bring sometime a book that is relevant to what we are making. As artists, like I say, uh, uh, a painter, a sculptor, a composer is a channel of what's happening in daily life. Mm -hmm. And we were really living that as yeah, a group of artists yeah. working on the show. We were picking up on everything that was happening in our daily life to feed the maelstrom of the process. One of Cirque du Soleil's earliest shows opened with a mirror ball in the background. You know, there is also a mirror ball in the background. This is from La Nuba, the two clown characters dressed up like astronauts. The show closed in 2017, but here the costume reappears. I suspect this was added after the show closed. You can see the lighting stencils for Kidama on the ground, bricks, and a rosette church window. In O, we see the bricks. And in the aerial hoops act, we see the rosette church window. Also from Kidam, we see the stencil of clouds. Behind the zebras, we see clouds and a checkerboard on the ground. In Allegria, a checkerboard on the ground. These are books about an Italian folkloric character named Gufa. Our similarly dressed main protagonist is also named Gufa. Esther Williams dives off a swing in Million Dollar Mermaid. A performer dives off the garden swing in O. Oh. Aquatic films probably inspired this line of women diving into the water. And I'm starting to wonder if these men holding these red silks are the inspiration for the comets. A woman wearing a red dress shaking about from Fellini's Roma, and the character Red Dress dancing in a similarly strange fashion. Another of Fellini's large-breasted strange women may have inspired the character that I can only call Big Boobs. The creator knows what the reference is and how it's relevant, but it's not explained to you. The first time I did, the first show I did uh, in, in uh, Montreal, uh, what we did together in 85, they, right away they, oh, they say, oh, Fellini. Fellini was never, uh, for me, uh, something that I tried to do, you know, like, but of course I like what, what he has done. The tendency in North American culture, it's to explain everything. What Fellini has done, it's not to explain everything, it's to open to each other, to let the people close the story, to participate. People think that participation is to be there and doing this. For me, participation, for a, a spectator, it's not doing only this yet. It's really uh, teasing their imagination and let them uh, it's like a mirror you have in front of you. And Fellini is this. It allows you to personalize the experience to what's going on in your life. You are actively looking and digesting and trying to observe as much as you can and trying to make sense of it. And you can tell that there is some sense to be made. He expects you to be a smart, thoughtful person who's capable of processing a lot of information and making sense out of it. The next element is world building. There's a sufficient level of detail presented in every show that makes you infer additional detail that's not being presented to you. There are characters, they interact with each other, they follow the rules of their universe. So to me, one of the best examples of characters and world building is with the comets or these red men. They are the red curtain, they are fractured pieces of the red curtain and much like the curtain they fly through the air you can see pieces of fabric flying through the air and the curtain that's laying across the pool floats on top of the pool it doesn't go in the water 
like here it's raining in the theater and they cover themselves up with umbrellas to protect themselves from the water because they don't like the water. You'll also see four of them bungeeing down from above and you can see them diving off, but they're in their underwear. They're not wearing the red part of their costume. Here, he touches the water, but he just skims the surface. He doesn't want to go in. Here, the mermaids have to bring the cables to the red men. They can't get them themselves. All of this builds up to this moment where the rich woman shoves one of the comets into the water while he's wearing his outfit. And of course you can see him get out of the water and he's very pissed off. And he's headed towards her to give her a piece of his mind until he's stopped. Contrast this against the behavior of the zebras instead. They're very awkward. They're very much uh, bound to the earth. They, they can't really fly they have to use an apparatus to fly. And even the way they move, the way they dive into the water itself is quite awkward. So the more you think about the show, the more you realize that there is this internal consistency. There are these rules and there's this little universe that's been built. Do you have to give the, 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 the image to the audience that backstage, there and there, there is a, a, a mysterious world. You live in this world. The next element is contrasts. The Golden Age shows, they sample all of the human emotions. We wanted maybe to scream allegria. It's impossible to have only joy. It's impossible to have only uh, tears. Joy is always with tears and tears is always with joy. And this is emotional contrasts in sound and lighting. Of course, there's plenty of joy and elation that you'd expect in a circus show, but let's not forget that the opening act has people swimming through murky, unlit waters and drowning. There's also women unconscious hanging from ropes that are lowered into water. We also have a woman who's so heartbroken and jaded that she dives into the water, uh, never to return, were it not for a daring rescue. We have a celebratory funeral. The clowns provide yet another contrast. They're doing dick jokes and potty jokes, and they really help to remind people we're just having fun here. Franco was very concerned about coming off as overly pretentious or overly self-important. They're very sympathetic characters, these two lonely people out on the ocean together. Um, and they also refer back to the history of Cirque du Soleil as always having this sort of uh, humble roots uh, of street performance and clowning. From a sound perspective, there are moments when you have only one instrument. It's very meditative, very quiet. But of course, that contrasts against moments of thunderous music. And with lighting, we have moments where the stage is bathed in bright light and moments where the only light comes from open flame. And yet another contrast being lit from behind in this beautiful shadow play. I will also say it's not just that there's a huge variety of these things. The transition and the ordering feel very delicate. In a moment of high tension, you're relieved to then flow into a, you know, a calmer moment. In this scene, we transition from the shallow, calm watering hole into a toxic-looking swamp, and you get a bit of a chill when these mermaids turn towards the audience with their sunken eyes. Much later in the show, another transition, the mermaids appear out of the black water to exit the pool, much less menacing than when they arrived, and they join the zebras and the married women on stage. Another interesting transition in mood. Another element is mysticism and religious references. Certainly in O, you see a censor at the opening of the show. This is something that's typically used in a religious ceremony. You see a cross on, on the waist of one of the characters. They take an audience member, they drop him into the water, and then they transform him, which I view as a baptism. There's references to death. There's a funeral in this show. There's a wedding in this show. Those are religious ceremonies that mark milestones in the human life. It's also worth noting that the wedding and funeral happen at the exact same time. This brings another symbol of duality. This wedding bell here, this church bell here, could signal either a wedding or a funeral. 
big, lofty questions to be asking when it comes to a silly circus show. Frankel was aware that people have an innate need for a mystical or religious understanding of the world. He refers to the theater as a cathedral or a church, and he wanted to create a mythology around the performers. It's become a cathedral, this, okay? It's helped us to build images. This studio will be really a church. Je disais aux artistes il y a un mois de cela, je dis, je, mon défi c'est que lorsque les, les gens vous rencontrent dans la rue, qu'ils vraiment qu'ils soient intimidés par vous. En créant justement une, une manière de se démarquer, c'est en créant un certain mythe peut-être. Comme le cirque est déjà un mythe. The next element would be a real um, desire to focus on human beings, not on technology and not on machinery. This show and all of the Golden Age shows are technically sophisticated and you don't really notice it while you're watching the show. And there are a number of moments, the uh, trapeze bow at the beginning of the show, it is a very difficult thing to do. And from an audience perspective, you might only barely notice that they're being lifted out of the water by people, not by a platform, not by a machine, but by people. It's another example is the bateau act. The ship moves back and forth. It is powered entirely by the performers, uh, pushing it back and forth and then slowing it back down to a stop. Probably an easy opportunity to put a motor on that ship and make it move the ship back and forth. But uh, Franco and the creative team decided that it was more special in full view of the audience to have the apparatus be powered by the human beings upon it. There's a moment where the lifts lift up and the rescue divers are all there acting like fish out of water. There are some human beings here that you have not noticed. Here they are. It's a focus on the human and, and away from the machinery, really trying to make sure that machinery doesn't dwarf the human performance. Finally, I'll point out this moment in this multi-million dollar hotel and multi-million dollar show. The chambermaid has the spotlight. She seems a little bit sad, maybe always a bridesmaid and never a bride, but here she has the spotlight for few moments. Finally, this is maybe one of my favorite things, I, maybe I saved the best for last, is the costumes. And Dominique Lemieux is the costume designer for this show and for all of the Golden Age shows. I cannot overstate the impact that Dominique Lemieux's costumes have on this show. I might even say that it's worth the price of admission to just be able to view people wearing these costumes and walking through the theater. The number of influences throughout time and space, a number of them appear for perhaps a minute on stage, far in the background or in silhouette. The costumes alone, you could probably see this show 15 times and every single time find a new character that you've never seen before. While she's clearly a genius, um, I think she probably was a muse for Franco Dragon. I think he probably was totally delighted by the things that she would create. They're so bizarre and fanciful and lovely and touching. And just the sheer number, she's just shaking costumes out of her sleeves and Franco Dragon is throwing them on stage. I've shown many examples here, but there are more. There's too many to show. And underneath the seats in the theater, there is a small factory working day and night to keep these costumes in, in working order. If you want to know more about Dominique Lemieux in particular, there is a documentary called La Griffe Magique. On top of being an incredibly talented person, she also seems like one of the most sweet, humble people 
um, on the planet. She also had an episode uh, in the, on the podcast uh, Tapi Rouge with uh, Yem Koshua. Yeah, she's one of my idols. So my theory is that the essential elements of a Golden Age show are a core of physical performance, simple, non-linguistic plot, strong images and staging, to use Franco's words, images that think. Using lots of inspiration and open-ended references, building a fantasy world that exists beyond the boundaries of the stage, numerous contrasts in emotion and lighting and music, in performance skills, mysticism, mythology, appealing to a higher power, working against the machine and always having a humanist point of view, and of course strong, memorable characters and costumes. Putting it all back together, what are we sort of left with? Especially for a complex show like this, all shows have positives and negatives. While O is a really great show in my opinion and suits a certain mood and suits a certain need for me, it doesn't mean I, I can't point at certain things and say, well, there's some compromise here. So rather than saying what, what, what my favorite acts are, I think it's easy to point out sequences that I think are just incredible. So the first sequence uh, is the opening of the show. There's an incredible amount of anticipation. You have this imposing red curtain. It's massive. The clowns come out and they kind of loosen people up a little bit, get people a little bit woken up. And again, you have this little clown standing in front of this massive imposing red curtain. You have a woman come through the ceiling and she drops her red silk. This is Aurora. She's choosing a human lover. You have the red men carrying him down to the curtain, the hand poking through the curtain. Very bizarre, very strange. All of this is building, and then the tension is released in one moment. That's an incredible study in tension and release, and I think a lot of people are really uh, impressed by and enjoy the, the curtain pulling aspect. But what makes this so memorable in O is that there's this incredible slow build of tension where there was this bright red curtain, there's now this dark, rotting, strange space on the other side. And there are two main symbols suspended in the air. There's a Elizabethan woman, on a dress form. And then on the other side, you have a man who is faceless and uh, rotting, uh, like a cadaver. Looks like he's been bitten in the lower half. Then you have the synchro swimmer showing up for the first time. They appear feet first. Uh, their feet appear to be small creatures of this little universe. Then they go through this scene that feels a little bit like they're drowning. They pull this man into the water and then they transform him. This whole sequence from the moment you walk in the door of the theater to the moment that Gufa arrives on stage, to me this is one of the most exhilarating parts of the show. It is a perfect study in tension and release and I think it's giving you some subliminal messages about what you're about to watch and what you're about to observe. The second sequence that I really love is the first time that we transition to dry land. The theater goes to dark, they bring up the lifts, and the audience really can't detect that change because the theater is quite dark and they have started lighting from behind. All of a sudden you see Gufa walk around the front of the theater and then you see him walk directly backwards. The minute you realize he's on top of the water, all of these other creatures start running out in silhouette, dancing in this watering hole. Your heart sort of sings in this moment. It's a bit of a magic trick. The musician who comes out on the side is playing the Korra. It's beautiful. They have a bird character sailing through the air in silhouette. And then this fades out and you have the mermaids coming in looking very creepy, very dark. The water returns and it's green and brackish, swampy looking. And the ghost ship comes out. I love this number. I love the music. I love the image. I love that the water is orange and green. I love the characters walking in a circle around the front and back, marching through the afterlife and we have these sailors whose skin has been removed from their body performing on top of a of a ghost ship ultimately that whole transition from dry land through to the bateau act is so compelling third the sequence with the red men is really it's not much of an act 
It's really just an interstitial. There is something about the red men flying through the air with the silk straps, that feeling, that weightlessness, the speed at which they're moving, the way that their costume and the straps are soaring through the air. The music is really cute. It's very adorable. One of the interesting things about the Comet characters is that these are very imposing, you know, physically fit, strong people. They're given these very cute, very harmless, friendly characters. It's very beautiful. It's exhilarating. Lastly, uh, a special shout out to the moment right before the fire act, the travesty character comes out and performs a dance. Up to this point in the show, you're looking all around, you're, you're balancing where you want to look and having to focus. In this moment, all of a sudden your attention is brought down to just one circle on the stage, one performer. You can feel everybody all of a sudden having a shared experience. And that character is performing a dance that is this incredible mixture of strength and then also so this incredible feminine energy at the same time. It's just a very, very strong performance. It takes a certain personality and a presence to be able to have everyone in this audience look at you and to be screaming and laughing and dancing. It's just a powerful moment. Everybody I've taken to see the show over the past five years or so, people have leaned over and said, that was cool or that guy's hot you know so <laughs> it's just this this sexual energy this strength this this blend of masculinity and femininity it's just powerful it's just a very cool powerful moment and, uh, and Robert Knowles does a great job of being able to command that attention Let's talk about the misses really quick. Compared to something like Mystere, the audience participation is very different energy, right? In Mystere, they dress a man up as a baby, they drive him around on a golf cart. In O, there's very little, like, real true audience participation, except for the clown dance. And I would not be surprised to find out that this was because of insurance. O feels a lot more staged in that regard. They're very transparent about that, at least. But again, it's a trade off. There's a little bit of distance between the performance and the audience. In general, the way this theater is laid out is very different from the other resident shows. I've never been up in like the third tier, but I imagine it does feel quite distant from up there. So that's just the reality of the distance from the farthest seat. I've always felt that a couple of the acts, it was hard to tell whether they were formally acts or just transitions. The zebras, for example, I've always wondered, is that just a simple transition? Is it just a cool image? Or was it supposed to be a formal act? Similarly for the barge, it felt a little bit small for the stage. I don't know why that is. Just the, the overall presentation made it feel a little bit small or not super impactful. I've heard and seen that they have replaced the barge act. You know, it's pretty much the same, but it's more like Bankeen. Anyway, I'm excited to see how they've redone that act. I've always had this question in the show is there's two trapeze acts, the duo trapeze and the trapeze Washington. You know, if I'm looking at it optimistically, a trapeze Washington is essentially a balancing skill, whereas duo trapeze is a trapeze skill and operating a trapeze with two people on it at the same time. But in recent years, they've switched the duo trapeze off into a single trapeze. The image of both acts is very similar. And so in my mind, sometimes the difference between those two has become even harder to distinguish over the years. It would be interesting for them to find a way to strongly differentiate them and making sure Sure that it stands strong in comparison to the other. One tip I have, this is sort of a practical tip, I think there are two shows in one. If you want to see everything and get a, a much bigger grasp of what's going on and what the images of the show are, sit back a little bit. 20 rows back in the center I think is a great place to view the show when you want to see the overall picture. If you want more of a roller coaster ride type experience, go in the first five rows. You can hear the individual sounds that they're making. During the bateau act, you can hear all of their shoes scraping on the ground. This eerie, creepy, squeaky kind of noise. Highly recommend I'm sitting up close so you can hear that and you can see the individual details on their costumes. They are very different experiences. Generally speaking, for a first time viewer, I might say go three quarters of the way back in the front section. That's a good good place to view it. To wrap all this up, what do I think this show is about? The idea that this show is about theater is 
interesting. Wasn't Kidama a show about theater? Isn't Mystere a show about theater? Like, but I actually think there's a more detailed and nuanced way to look at what is being presented here. I couldn't put it together in my head for a while because there's a sort of a mixed bag of stuff here. We cannot say that each show has a team, but we choose a team uh, just to, to guide us, uh, a team to have a, a discussion between us. And uh, I used to say that a team for me is like a country you decide to visit. It's why we choose a team. So we have something to, to debate and those discussions give us the strength to do the, the show. There's a lot about death in this show, and there's a lot about life in this show. That makes sense to me. You know, we have, oh, the circle of life, water is the source of life. That all makes sense to me. I really think there's a lot of questions about what are your priorities and what are you pursuing in life? Do you want status? You know, when you see this woman pining over this Elizabethan dress, it's like she wants to be queen or she wants to be princess. She's obsessed with that status. And how does that compare against the status of the cleaning woman? So I think there's that open question of what does life mean to you and what are you pursuing? What are you prioritizing in your one opportunity to live life? But I also think it is commenting a bit on greed. You also have Lilith. We talked about Lilith already. Um, she's she's a dual character, somebody who causes problems for, for Adam. She's also somebody who is standing up to Adam. So I think there is a commentary about women and I couldn't put together why those two things would be paired together in this show. What is the meaning of life? What are our priorities? What are we pursuing? and female sexuality and women kind of being independent, standing up for themselves. When it comes to the female sexuality part, Franco Dragon always made shows thinking about the environment around him, the time and the place, and he's making a show in Las Vegas. I think he's looking at a city that's filled with greed and also the subjectification of women, of showgirls and prostitution. You know, I, I think that that's maybe where that came from. I want to meditate on, on a powerful female character, and you see that in a variety of ways. You have barge act, you also have the character La Travesti, who again is this incredible dual mix of male energy and female energy. I love this idea that there's this little oasis in the deep heart of this city that is challenging those notions. I truly don't know if anybody agrees with me on this. At the end of the day, those are the things that I see and I feel that Franco Dragon is wanting us to talk about. And I think the deepest, most atomic message is about the duality of life. And what I mean by that is almost every image of the show has a paired image that is almost equal and opposite. Let me just show a couple of examples. You see this beautiful silken curtain with golden embroidery dyed this bright red unnatural color. And when the curtain is pulled away, you have an opposite image, this natural, organic, rotting. It's, it's almost the opposite, this vegetation curtain. Two images you're really presented with in the first few seconds of the show is the Elizabethan gown, wealth, splendor, royalty, a well-to-do person in society. And then you have a man who is dead. He looks like a shark has bitten him in half. Maybe this is a sailor. Maybe this is somebody who fell into the water and has been claimed by nature. So you just have these sort of constant dual images. Uh, the mermaids themselves, you have this femininity to them. They're beautiful and flirty and fun and friendly sometimes. And then sometimes they are terrifying. They look like they will pull you under. They really are like sirens. They draw men in, and in some cases they kill men. The show has zebra characters. They're black and white, this duality of color. The stage itself can go from black to white. The show has many allusions to horses. Horses can be both wild and tame. The show has several references to the moon. The moon causes high tides and low tides. The duality of water itself. Water is something that we cannot live without, and yet very easily it can kill us. The same applies to the element of fire. I think that's the central message of the show, that life is filled with things that we need and that at the same time can destroy us. We need love, and yet we will lose those loved ones. Everything in life has an upside and a downside. The church bell. Does a church bell signal a funeral or a wedding? 
the comets, the characters, the comets. A comet is, a, is an omen. It's a sign of something to come. But the something to come is ambiguous. And again, at this point in time, Franco Drago, at that stage, is at the height of his career, building the world's most incredible theater for its time, and also struggling in some ways. The possibility for all things in life to be both great and horrible. It's impossible to have only joy. It's impossible to have only uh, tears. Joy is always with tears, and tears is always with joy. In the end, the viewer is left with a message that human life is beautiful, absurd, wondrous, full of passion, full of exhilaration, and unfortunately, temporary. Well, I have some thank yous to give. Certainly, um, first and foremost, Benedict Negro is uh, a performer who plays Le Vieux. You know his face well. And um, we had some very nice conversations and, and I love to pick his brain about a variety of things. He's, he's, a, he's a very um, talented person and a very um, nice person. I also want to thank Gabriel Dubé Dupuy for sharing his story on Tapis Rouge. Um, he was in an incredible position to see the genesis of the show and the, the process of the show. On the note of Tapis Rouge with Guillaume Cochois, I've mentioned it a couple of times, fantastic podcast. He gets the right people, he asks them the right questions, as so you should listen to every episode. I think he does a great job. I also want to thank the creative team. Obviously, I think a lot about your work and I appreciate what you've done. I hope that you get joy out of seeing me talk about your show this much. I hope that's entertaining, if nothing else. That theater feels like a temple. It's a place where people come together to perform this ritual. I mean, to think about the amount of positivity, introspection, inspiration. What a legacy for that creative team.